The interview today is with uh, Dr. Alan Forker. Dr. Forker is uh, a former governor of the Missouri chapter and our master of the American College of Physicians. Um, it's good to talk to you. Good to talk to you, Get, get started. I, I, I think I saw that you grew up in a small town in Texas, uh, not too far from Oklahoma. Is that right? Uh, it's not right, actually, Dan. I grew up in Kansas in a small, I was born in a small town of 3,000 called Kingman, Kansas, out in the center of the state, ah. where my dad was a school teacher and a junior and a junior high principal. That's where, and a basketball coach. That's where I was born into. So Kingman, Kansas, uh, uh, <laughs> cute little town about 40 miles straight west of Wichita. So that's where I started. So, yep. um, did your mother work outside the home or would she stay at home or? My mom, both of my parents were raised on a farm in central Kansas uh, and they both went to rural schools until the eighth grade. Those one room schoolhouses, well, that's where they went. And then they met in Haven High School where uh, mom was a year older. And uh, <laughs> my dad was named Marvin, but uh, because he apparently drove a, a car pretty fast. They nick nicknamed him Barney after Barney Oldfield, who was a famous race driver back in those days. So my dad was Barney for the rest of his life was Barney Forker. And uh, Haven was a good uh, a good a good base because all my childhood we were always going back to see people and the family in Haven, Kansas. Now Haven is kind of dried up. I think it's the downtown is non-existent and sad many small towns so anyway but it was a good it was a good childhood did did um, did your uh, dad go to school uh, locally did he go to one of those state teachers colleges dad was uh, didn't have much money in those days so he went to Hutchison Juco the first year and then got a scholarship uh, to Fort Hayes State College in in Kansas so you can see I'm a pretty much a native Kansan which we'll talk about later um, and my mom didn't go to college. She was a high school graduate. She wanted to be a nurse, but uh, her, uh, her farm parents, especially her mother said, women don't become nurses. That's not, a, that's not an ethical profession to be in for a woman. You will not be a woman. So she always kind of had that chip on her shoulder. She compensated by being a musician both a pianist and an organist uh, for a variety of churches. Wonderful, wonderful uh, musician. That's how she compensated, but was not, didn't finish uh, her education like she wanted to, which is, I think, pretty common for women back in that age. We're talking about the 30s, the 20s and 30s now. You know, women didn't have the same opportunities they do now. Yeah, the, the um, <clears throat> of course, you know, the, my grandmother's generation and my mother's generation, most of the teachers were women and many of them yeah. you know, started out by going to those normal schools. Right. And the normal schools sort of evolved to become state teachers colleges and then yeah. they evolved oftentimes to become state universities. So um, so it, it clearly, uh, you know, is kind of a, 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 a seen as a, a, a professional role that a woman could have and now, of course, they can hold any professional role. And I think the, our schools are suffering as a result. Yeah. Is the pay necessary to, to attract the kind of people that used to be there is not sufficient. I know. My dad finished his education uh, after, after about six or eight years being a teacher and a principal. He uh, wisely went back to KU. Well, he didn't go to KU until then. He went back to and got a junior high principal job in Topeka, Kansas, and uh, and that's only 20 miles from Lawrence. So he got his master's in, in uh, school education and then got his first job as a superintendent in a cute little town called Medicine Lodge. Another 3,000 people. Were you, still in, were you still in school at home at that point? Yes. Yeah. 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 Uh, <clears throat> That and that's a, that's interesting, Dan, because I went to first grade in uh, in uh, 
Cherryville, Kansas, way down in the southeast corner of Kansas, the second grade in Topeka and the third grade in Medicine Lot. So three years in a row, we I was in a different school. Well, with uh, with farmer. Oh, by the way, is the family farm still in the family? I, I missed that. Say that again. Is your farm still in the family or did it get sold? The farms, both well, of course, all those folks are deceased. And uh, yeah, the farms got sold. I did have a cousin, a first cousin, to, who had that farm, who had my uh, grandparents' farm for a long time. Unfortunately, he got a brain cancer and died, and then that was sold. Yeah, so all the farms were gone. Yeah. Growing up with uh, a teacher, what what um, what made you consider medicine? How did you decide that you were going to become a doctor? Yeah. It's a good question because in high school I had a fabulous uh, I had a fabulous chemistry. He also taught physics that I could not fond of. <laughs> but I, I don't know about you, Dan, but I had, uh, I fell in love with chemistry, but, and it's largely due to a teacher who knew how to teach chemistry, as we've seen many times, both high school, college, and medical school. The teacher that you really like really knew how to communicate with you, and you could identify with their perspective. Well, Larry Lang was his name, and he was just a fabulous. So I became at, at University of K at KU, where I went to undergraduate. Uh, I was a chemistry major and had 28 hours of chemistry. But wisely, one day, one of my good friends in high school, who became the valedictorian, and I was the I was the understudy, and uh, the. And we only, and I only missed being valedictorian, but I think point of two points. But the point is, Larry Lane one day in the in the chemistry class, his name was Steve Bowles, and Steve and I were always fighting each other, always competing with each other who get the best grade. And one day, Larry Lane said, "Well, you two stay after class. I want to talk to you too." And he said, "What are you two thinking about? Uh, we're seniors in high school." Or are we juniors? Yeah, I think we were juniors, seniors. We took physics and said, what are you two thinking about? You're both going to college. So what are you thinking about? And he looked me in the eye and said, with your love of chemistry, you ought to be a doctor. And that really was a starting starting point. Uh, there was nobody in my in my family who was a doctor. They were all farmers and teachers. So uh, uh, to, to go to medical school was just uh, my my dad couldn't believe it. Says, "What's that going to cost?" <laughs> it's good for him that I got a couple scholarships, uh, and I got married, and uh, and Susie worked, so uh, we got through. We we survived. Yeah, so you you were convinced you were going to become a doctor from the time you started in undergraduates. College? Yeah, you know, I was I was a little wishy washy about that because. Uh, I also was exposed in undergraduate school to history. I don't know if you took some fun history classes, but I had 18 hours of history. And in uh, the history chairman, I had a course from him and said to me one day, uh, have you considered being a history professor? And I said, well, tell me about it. And he said, I could, if you would apply for a Woodrow Wilson fellowship, I think we could help you get that and hope you would come back to join our faculty. I'll tell you, Dan, I had a strong, a strong pull that way for a while. And even to this day, I would say, I wonder if I should have been a history professor, but nope, the pull to medicine somehow, somehow won. And, uh, and I was, do you recall what tuition was at KU in medical school then? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Then the, you know, the first year of medical school, history-wise, at KU was still on the Lawrence campus uh, <laughs> in an old, old building. And the class after me was the last class, and then they added on in, in the main campus in Kansas City. And so the building there became the first year of uh, first year medical student building, first and second year. But that last year was in uh, Lawrence, and that was handy because my wife was a graduate student. She was a year older and graduated. She was now a graduate student and working in the uh, liberal arts co uh, college office. So it was handy because she was right there. 
I was right across the street in school, and she was across the street uh, working in the liberal arts college. You know. What what year was that? Uh, let's see, Dan. That was I graduated in '60. She graduated in '59. Yeah, started medical school in 1960. Graduated medical in '64. Right. Ten years later, at Nebraska, the annual tuition at the medical school I think was seven hundred dollars. Do you remember what it was in Kansas in 1960? I think you hit the nail on it. I think it was exactly $700. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So, <laughs> just, it's hard to believe. And I had a, I had a scholarship. I had a tuition scholarship, thank goodness. And so I uh, said, whew, where am I going to get $700? And uh, I talked to the dean of students, and he said, well, that's no problem. We'll get you a scholarship and pay your tuition. So that was handy. But... $700, what, hardly need a scholarship for that, but got it, yeah. So so uh, tell me a little bit about um, your time in medical school. Uh, uh, you know, I, I think um, sometimes it gets exaggerated. I know when I started medical school, the, the dean uh, told us that Duke was different because when he was a student, uh, the dean said, to the incoming class, look to your right and look to your left. One of you is not going to be here in four years. Did you get any of that sort of thing? I've always heard that story from, but I we, we were not told that. We had 105 in our class, four women, four women. One of them flunked out after the first year, but the other three were really outstanding students, became really, really outstanding doctors. But just think of that now. Yeah. UMKC, 60% uh, of the class are women. One of the highest in the in, in the country, but uh, women were just, you know, in internal medicine. I bet it was same in your residency when we got to residency at the uh, at the at the Mayo Clinic. Uh, I don't remember a single female internal medicine resident. I can't remember right now any of them. Yeah. So times have changed. Yeah. yeah. What, what were the first two years like? Was it uh, pretty intensive? Uh, oh yeah. Organization and so on. Uh, yeah, you know, if you look back at that and say, how did you survive? Uh, I did not like, well, it was all lecture the first two years. Yeah, we had a little bit of physical diagnosis. And we had a, I remember we rounded on the wards and uh, at KU Med with a resident and showed us a couple of patients, but it wasn't really clinical in those days. It was, it was all books, it was all study. And gross anatomy just grossed me out. I don't know about your my experience with, with that cadaver. I did not like the the smell or the, or the literally the taste of a of a dead person cutting on that. That never did sit well with me. Yeah, so, but so, sophomore year and sophomore year really scored with me because of pathology. The pathology was the first time I could see the end of the road. Saying, "Hey." disease and disease process now we're talking now i can understand why i want to be a doctor yeah <laughs> but the first year just oh my god that was that was tough to, to really say keep at it keep at it you know physiology pharmacology neuroanatomy oh my god I, <laughs> some Go medical ahead. students back then had side jobs working in the lab or yeah, blood or so on. Did you have any side jobs when you were in medical school? Well, thank, uh, thank goodness now for Susie and uh, being married, uh, and she had a job, and I had uh, actually two scholarships. But uh, no, you know, I didn't have to. Uh, and my and my folks, well, both parents. <laughs> That's kind of a fun story, Dan. My uh, my wife's dad was a car dealer in Wichita, Kansas. Was the chief Pontiac dealer. And so my classmates just couldn't understand that uh, I was driving a demonstrator from that uh, from that agency. And every three months, my father-in-law would call and say, we're sending you up a new demonstrator. You got too many miles on the one you're driving. So they'll be up and you'll get a new one. So every three months, we had a new car. <laughs> <laughs> and we had that all through medical school. And it wasn't until I got through training and then two years in the navy that we finally my father-in-law said okay for her this is it you're buying a car <laughs> so 
I, I'm of the impression that there weren't that many medical students that were married at that time. How, how many students were married oh, yeah. in your class? All of our, I, I would, I would think at least half, but oh, really? all of our close friends uh, were, were all married. And it was good from that standpoint because our social life was built around uh, one, I played on a softball team and we had a good team and we actually traveled to Columbia, Missouri and played Columbia and, and uh, freshman, freshman softball. But the, uh, but the social life, one, about once a month, we had one, we had four other couples or five, five other couples uh, that we would get together once a month and everybody bring something to eat and then play bridge. We played bridge, which I did not like very much, but to be social, I learned how to play bridge. It was a good time. I mean, we had lots of sharing, lots of groaning and bitching about classes and professors, but it was really a sharing time and you really felt like you had good friends uh, through. Uh, we all had our first kid together. So, uh, yeah. When was your first child born? We were married in 59 and Jeff was born in 61 when I was a sophomore, sophomore in medical school. Must have been hard to study with a newborn around. Oh my. Well, that's an interesting story because that winter of that week after he was born was one of the coldest in Kansas City. And in February of that year, we had a rental house that was old, one of those old rickety homes up in a block east of uh, the KU Med, and it was uh, didn't have any insulation, and it was below zero. And so uh, Susie said, I can't take this. I'm taking Jeff and going to Wichita, where I can get some a warm house with a, with a good, uh, what, <laughs> good escape from this cold. So she took off and uh, went down there and uh, stayed down there, if I remember right, about 10 days with her parents and with this newborn uh, because it was just too cold. And I, I remember sitting at my desk studying with a heavy a sweater and a coat on and gloves on, sitting at my desk in this house studying. <laughs> Isn't that a terrible, a terrible uh, old... Uh, uh, stove and uh, <laughs> an unfinished dirt floored basement and it was old house yeah <laughs> so what was it uh, what was it like when you started your clerkships what was your medicine clerkship like oh uh, clerkship was great uh, because the first clerkship I took was internal medicine and that uh, and I had a, and again some good mentors uh, one of the best one I had, it was named Max Allen. And Max Allen, Dr. Allen was a general internist and a fabulous teacher. And boy, he just made it click. He said, well, this is really fun. And now we're into, we had some, we're lucky back and this is uh, 1958, it would be. And you remember we had quite a bit of rheumatic heart disease patients out on the in the hospital back then. And we had just some fabulous uh, physical diagnosis cases, and he just was, <laughs> here's an interesting story, Dan. One day we walked uh, in our rounding group, we walked in the door of the old ward with about eight patients in there, and one patient's young man sitting across the room in a chair, and his, uh, and Dr. Allen said, Allen, what's the diagnosis of that patient? I said, what we haven't examined him. Let's walk a little closer and said, well, look at him. The diagnosis you can make by looking at him. And the point is he had a head bob. His head was his head was bobbing and he had wide open aortic insufficiency. <laughs> he said, just look at him. There's the diagnosis. And that was stuck with me ever since. All you gotta do is look at the patient and make the diagnosis. You said on the wards, was this the old Kansas City General or, or where was it? Uh, Kansas City General, interesting, was uh, uh, was not part of the University of Kansas at all. The VA hospital over in Missouri, in Missouri, because UMKC was didn't open until 1970. Right. Uh, 
And so we had a, yeah, I had both medicine and surgery. Part of the rotation was over at the VA hospital on the Missouri side. It's a good thing I had medicine first, Dan, because the second rotation was on surgery. And I like a lot of a junior medical students on surgery, boy, it turned me off in a hurry. You go in the OR, you do all the scut work and draw all the blood and do all the EKGs. And, and then they take you into the OR and hang on for dear life to a, to a, to a retractor or some kind. I said, this is the most boring, unstimulating thing I ever did. So too bad for surgery. <laughs> so what was your life like on the medicine wards? What was your rotation like? What did you do? Well, it was uh, both at the VA and at the KU Med Center. It was, uh, it was a lot of work, as you remember. Uh, there were a lot of uh, long days into the evening, but uh, thank goodness I was lucky to have uh, usually pretty good interns and a, and, a, and a resident that gave you lots of advice and supervision. But uh, I remember working very hard, working patients up. You remember the first couple of patients you worked up? And I had a little cheat sheet over here to uh, see what kind of questions am I supposed to ask? <laughs> and another cheat sheet to say, now, where do I start on the physical exam? Well, I, that was easy. Eventually it said, start at the head and go at the toe. Now, you don't have to remember anything. You can do it that way. So uh, those first uh, eight or 10 workups you did, they were pretty they were pretty tough to remember and to get it all organized. Boy, oh boy. Do you have to present at the bedside from memory? Yeah. Oh, yes. Eventually, it became memory. And when I was a senior, I, uh, I had some really, really good times. Uh, uh, I had three months of elective. If I remember right, I took it on cardiology, hematology, and pulmonary. And those were the professors that I really liked the best, good teachers, but also good residents. And we just had a, that time they gave me lots of responsibility kind of as a sub intern. Uh, I remember one time we had a patient on hematology who was on steroids and, and they were telling me to write the orders. Let's, let's go ahead and write the orders. And, I remember I wrote all the orders on this on that patient with uh, probably had I don't know what diagnosis was, but I forgot to put the steroid, whatever steroid was back and then probably prednisone. I forgot it, and the next morning I arrived and I said, "Oh my God, I don't think I put it on there," and the resident kind of grinned at me and said, "I got your hind end, fella. I wrote it." <laughs> so that was a that was a really really that set that sets you up uh, for internship when you're really tons of responsibility but those three months prepared me uh, for for internship were, were you expected to do your own uh blood draws and ivs and that sort of thing uh yes especially at especially at the VA. The VA was a total responsibility for all that. You had to come early to get all that done. Uh, at the med center, some of that, but not all. Uh, as an intern, I entered the University of Minnesota in, in, uh, in, in Minneapolis. And uh, there was some, some of that, but not as much I expected. But one of the reasons I chose the Mayo Clinic then was the Mayo Clinic, they treated you like gentlemen, and, and you didn't have to do any of that. When you were a student, did you have to do your own lab work? Did you have to, you know, uh, do gram stains and AFB smears and blood counts and so on and so on? Thank goodness, did not have to do gram stains anymore. Uh, uh, and they didn't have to do the blood work anymore. So I'd know, we, we did not have to do that anymore, mm -hmm. uh, which was, that was a big load off. Yeah. So that when, was, uh, when, when uh, you went to Mayo, uh, I know that later, uh, there was um, it was it was quite remarkable that the Mayo residents were expected to wear, you know, sport coats and ties and tr yes. trousers and so on, and not not white coats. Was that the way it was when you were a resident? That's it, right? No white coats. You were you were dressed uh, like you were later in life: the white shirt, tie, and a sport coat or a suit, but usually it's a sport coat. Yeah, no. 
even downtown with the uh, in the hospital versus at the clinic. Even at the clinic, uh, the, the the full time staff, men and women, a few women, but mostly men, uh, same way. No white coats. No white coats were allowed anywhere except in the probably in the lab and the non patient oriented area. But if it was a patient area, there were no white coats. It was. Yeah. So you mentioned that there were very few women in your class and, and few in your um, internship and residency class. Were there many people of other ethnicities, you know? Uh, in our fellowship class, yes, we had a, a guy from Israel, first of all, and, uh, and a man from uh, Canada. We had a Canadian native and an Israeli and the rest of us were all American origin. Uh, yeah, that was, I mean, jumping ahead to our later experience with the AC with college. I thought one of the things I enjoyed a lot about the college was, you know, as you know, we had lots of governors from all over the world that I had no exposure to. So anyway, but back to residency, uh, no, that was, uh, it was still, the Mayo was still pretty much, uh, and not that much women again. Not that much women uh, residents. Or, we had we had no residents or fellows I can remember that were women when I was there. Yeah. Yep. You recall? Do you recall what you got paid? Yes. <laughs> Three hundred dollars a month. No, wait a minute. Now, at intern, I made. $300 a month at Mayo, it, what, they doubled it, $600 a month. Now, it wasn't long after that that I think nationally the big uh, revolt happened with, with residencies and residency directors that finally was able to get a reasonable, in, a reasonable salary for, uh, for their house staff. But when I was a uh, second or third year resident and into fellowship, all of a sudden it was uh, boosted up to $1,000, $1,000 a month. Uh, yeah, of course, now, you know, they make 40 or 50,000, but uh, more. Yeah, I, I think you were right on the cusp, you know, um, the uh, Medicare, I think, was passed in 65, which then made funds available for graduate medical education. Yeah, which made a big difference, I think. So you were probably right on the cusp of that. Yeah, you graduated in '64, I guess. Yep, yeah. yeah. and finished uh, residency in '69. And uh, now, did you have military service in the uh, middle there or afterwards? I did, and wisely so, because as you know, the Vietnamese War was on during those late '60s, and uh, I'd had a some advice uh, from a, from an intern, if I've said, uh, you know, Forker, you ought to look at the Barry plan. It says, uh, we've got a war and uh, they're going to get you. If you don't, uh, you're going to go unless you have some type of plan for deferment. If you want to finish all your training, the Barry plan will allow you to finish all your training and then you'll go. So I did, but I joined the Barry plan and uh, Let's see, graduated in 64, finished in 69, and spent 69, 70, and 71, 69 to 71 in the in the Navy as a lieutenant commander. A tough place to be, Dan, the San Diego Naval Hospital. That's a shame. Isn't that a shame? Real shame. <laughs> and did, you, did you practice cardiology in San Diego? Yes, and that's the key, because uh, my best friend in residency was a general internist. And he had no deferment. And after the three years, uh, boom, he was gone. And he ended up in Da Nang. That's an interesting story about that, though. Uh, after my third year, I thought it was four-year deferment, but it was only three years. And I got all of a sudden a packet in the mail said, it was my orders to report for active duty in two weeks. I said, wait a minute, what's going on here? I called my dad and my father-in-law, both of them uh, had, we had, of course, still do, two senators from Kansas, and my dad knew one of them from, he was involved with the Teacher Association, and my father-in-law knew the other one through some business association. 
And make a long story short, uh, they both contacted their senators and they said, no problem. Your son's not trying to avoid going. They just need another year. So when I arrived in, uh, in San Diego Naval Hospital, I had my new chart. And interesting, on the front of that chart, Dan, was big red stamp was there, P.I., you know what P.I. stands for? Not a clue. Political influence. <laughs> 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 but it worked. I got my fourth year of training, and then I did my two years in the Navy. But it took a little political influence to get me there. <laughs> Fascinating. Now, the more things change, the more they stay the same. Huh? <laughs> so uh, what was your life like in the Navy? I mean, I, I know that uh, I think specialists really had a pretty good life uh, on, on stateside uh, assignments, didn't they? Oh, yeah. Uh, I had a couple of friends that, you know, Scott Air Force Base, just to the east of us here, was the uh, major pulmonary center for the Air Force. Yeah. So there yeah. were a couple of fully trained pulmonologists who later joined the faculty at WashU. Yeah, and they, I've heard And they, and they spent their time, you know, spent their time, uh, you know, not working very hard and having a pretty good time. Well, as a matter of fact, I worked pretty hard. But the good news is it was just like another two years of postgraduate work because San Diego Naval was the major referral center for the Pacific Ocean. So if you had a really diseased, hurt, somebody in real trouble on, the, in the, on a ship in the Pacific Ocean, they flew you right to San Diego. I remember a couple of cases of acute myocarditis that arrived and they were sicker in hell and they died because oh, wow. we didn't, they didn't, they died. We didn't have any internal balloon pumps or anything to keep them going to, to bite them over to the heart could heal some, but uh, no, it was busy. I would, uh, we had a cath lab that I was, it was very busy. We had an open heart team. And the reason, it, not only the active duty, is because San Diego is a major retirement area for, for the Navy. Right. You were on active duty and say, hey, this is pretty nice. And a lot of them stayed there. And we had lots of, oh, man, we had tons of heart disease. So we were busy full time taking care of both inpatients and outpatients with heart disease. Yeah. Interesting enough, though, uh, one month, they uh, thank goodness for my internal medicine background. Uh, one of them got sick, and uh, the, the uh, commanding officer, who was a one-star admiral, <laughs> and he said they contacted the chief of cardiology and said, uh, "Porker is going to take care of ward so and so, some building. We need him." So I was uh, just like I was uh, in the old days. I went over and. Rounded every day on 25, uh, an award of 25 sick sailors. And uh, I did that for a couple of months. Good old general internal medicine for, yeah. But the, most of the time, the vast, 90% of the time, I was a cardiologist uh, doing cardiology affairs. Yeah. Right. I, I have to ask a question. You know, um, I'm sure Rochester was even smaller then than it is now. And of course, oh, yeah. Very Not small southern Minnesota Much. plains. Yeah. Uh, did you feel isolated there at the Mayo Clinic, or was it the professional stimulation enough to keep you going? Yeah, you know that that's a very interesting story because back then Rochester was only about sixty thousand people, okay. and it was either the Mayo Clinic or IBM. IBM had a big plant there, of several thousand employees. So if you didn't work at Mayo, you worked at IBM. I knew, and the uh, you know, it, it felt like a smaller town. It really did. And it was a cozy, it was a cozy feel. And the atmosphere of, uh, of working together at the Mayo Clinic was really felt like a family. It was uh, much different than I'd had at KU and the internship at the University of Minnesota, where it was all, it felt awfully competitive, both as a student and as a resident, and I suspect as faculty. And I didn't, I, I'm sure there was some, but it, it felt more like family in Rochester. It was really very nice from that standpoint. And I had multiple opportunities to join the staff, but uh, 
from that standpoint, uh, interesting, Dan, uh, that felt, once you're at the level of staff, that felt a little suffocating to me because, you know, they're, I don't know. Then there were probably 40 or 50 cardiologists. Now there are 100 plus cardiologists. You know, just didn't seem to be a good place to have a chance to express what your real, what you wanted to be. A little tougher kind of be one of the guys and gals. Because now. Wife enjoy Rochester? What's that? Did your wife enjoy Rochester? Yes. And uh, that's, a, that's a neat story. When we went there, after we left University of Minnesota, you know, had absolutely no money, we found this cute little area on the east, out on East 4th Street in uh, Rochester, a cute little area of tiny little homes that were built after the end of World War II that had been kind of as, a, as the usual circumstance, bought by Mayo residents. I have a black cat here that's trying to join me. Okay. Okay. Now just relax. <laughs> and we bought a home for $16,900. That would be interesting to see what your first home was, but 60. And I, we didn't have any money. And my mother in law knew that and loaned me $900 for a down payment. And then I took out a loan. $16,900. Well, it turns out it was a wonderful place to live because both sides of us and behind us and down the street, we had, turns out, guys that were in the same rotations and we were all living in that area. It turned out to be a real family and lots of time sharing with dinners and all having kids. We had two, our two daughters were born in Rochester. And so uh, that's a usual circumstance. Uh, and nobody had any money again, so we would meet everybody, uh, bring a little food and get together back to bridge. I, although we finally quit that, said, let's quit that bridge. Let's do something else. <laughs> but uh, no, it was, a, it was a pleasant life. So the, the, and the, Navy, and the, the, how did you decide what to do next after you got out of the Navy? I, you know, I've got to finish before we leave oh, that so, internship. I don't know about you, but I arrived at University of Minnesota, and it was supposed to be an every third night call, and somebody didn't show up. Somebody got changed their mind. And so the first thing the chair of medicine announced is, and it's all, and it was 12 of us, supposed to be 13 with 12 of us, all males, six from Harvard. And me and another guy from west of the Mississippi, and the Harvard guys really thought they were top, top, top of the mountain. And he says, because we're missing one, you have every other night call. What the promise was every third day. No, nope, you have every other night call. Let me tell you, sometimes in the middle of that every other night call, I thought, Dan, why am I in this profession? I really thought about, uh, I'm supposed to be a history professor. This is not fun. So that internship year was the worst time of my life as far as medicine. And I think that was a common sentiment back in that era of uh, you have to live through that to prove your manhood so you can be a doctor. Thank goodness we don't put them through that anymore because that was inhumane, just totally inhumane. And Did the nice thing feel, about what's that? Did you feel injured at the end of that? Do you think you had, um, I don't know, for want of a better term, post-traumatic stress or depression oh, I, or anything as a result of yes. that? I think I did have post-traumatic stress because uh, I got a little depressed, I think, in the middle of one of those uh, rotations. Uh, thank goodness I had a real good chief resident. He was unbelievable. Uh, he was, he stayed on the faculty as an infectious disease uh, professor. Um, and sadly, I lost track of him. I don't, know, I don't even know if he's alive. But uh, you could go in and say, well, one, if, you're, if your resident wasn't able to help you too much, he was a single guy when we were interns. And he said, call me. 
And I will tell you four or five times when I was an intern, uh, I called him and said, I need help. I really need help. You know, an asthmatic, that was a status and you couldn't get him out. I said, I don't know what to do. I really need help. And he'd, he'd be, within 20 minutes, he'd be there right by your bedside. And if you had a social problem or a psychological problem, said, come see me, we'll talk. That, that, that chief resident really, I think more than anybody saved my mental status, my mental competency uh, as an intern. I'm not sure I would have survived that without someone like that you could go to. Yeah. Uh, so, yeah. After, uh, after Mayo and after the Navy, I really wanted to go and start an academic career and went to the University of Kansas. And the, the chair of cardiology then was one of my mentors. And he said, oh my gosh, we, we would love to have you. And I remember this still to this day, Arnie Greenberger was, uh, was the chair of medicine then a gastroenterologist, Boston trained. Mm -hmm. And I remember going in and sitting with the, uh, with Greenberger, and he said, yep, we want you, and uh, I've got this fabulous salary I want you to, <laughs> to repeat. Your salary is $24,000 a year. You hear that? $24,000 a year. I was married with three children and some debts to pay. How can you live on twenty four? No, that was back in the days that the, the private pra any private practice income for a faculty member was uh, was was not allowed. You didn't you didn't have it until the revolution of bringing in more pra like KU Med now and the Heart Institute has uh, it's a separate entity. It's on the KU campus, but it's actually a separate entity with private billing. Yeah. So, uh, boy, oh boy. I went into private practice in Lincoln, Nebraska, because as I, I had about six different places, we, the wife and I toured, and I got arrived in Lincoln, Nebraska, and it was a man who had, with two surgeons, had started an open heart program in Lincoln at this hospital called Bryan Memorial Hospital, and the administration had supported, they, have a, they had a brand new cath lab with modern equipment, and two heart surgeons freshly trained and I said wow this looks like a golden opportunity so we went to Lincoln Nebraska starting salary forty thousand dollars <laughs> well as you can see from the Navy and from the background forty thousand dollars and the KU saying we'll give you 24 was like a gold mine so so I started practice in uh, Lincoln, Nebraska, but uh, sadly, Dan, uh, a terrible, a terrible incident happened. My uh, my partner named Walt Weaver is uh, go back up. Walt Weaver, unbeknownst to me, before I arrived, actually divorced his wife that he had had four children with, and married the receptionist at the at the office. And when I arrived in Lincoln, he was on his honeymoon. And so I inherited the whole service. It used to be two people. Now it was just one. So the first month I was there by myself, I said, why, why am I doing this? But after he, after he came back, guys, he was a good guy. Until about six months later, maybe eight, six to eight months later, his first wife, his divorced wife, uh, murdered their 16-year-old daughter. Oh, no. And she was depressed and, and becoming psychotic. And on a psychotic break, murdered their 16-year-old daughter. And that just, just wiped, wiped Walt out and, and changed everybody's life. So dr dramatically that a year later I said, I can't, this is, this is too much, I'm leaving. So that's when I left and uh, ended up eventually on the University of Nebraska faculty. That was a good decision. So that's when I started my academic experience at the University of Nebraska. Yeah.
So private practice, uh, and at, at, that's half the story, Dan, because I went to the University of Nebraska and I worked for six, yes, I was there from 74 to 80, 1974 to 1980. And then I had a little, little tussle with my boss, the chief of cardiology. Uh, he had a heart attack and was out for a while. And he came back and he was no longer a cardiologist. The name was Bob Elliott, if you ever heard that name. He was no longer a cardiologist. He decided that his heart attack was all due to stress. And he started giving talks on stress medicine, which he was very good at. But we had six cardiologists and he was no longer available to us as a cardiologist. So within uh, within a year, uh, the th three best cardiologists, I would say, Two older ones were been on the faculty for ages, but the three of us that were younger, we all left. We could say we can't take this. And where did I go? Well, I tried to talk my wife and kids into going another academic, two other academic centers, and they said, "Nope, we're not going." But we will go back to Lincoln because that was a great experience, and go back to practice. So I went back to the same practice I left, but now there were four cardiologists and practiced for another 10 years in Lincoln. And in 1990, I, as you know, by then cardiology was changing dramatically and I was not trained in any form of intervention. I was the old fashioned bedside uh, diagnostic cath. And a key point is that in the Navy, I had been exposed to echocardiography and nobody in Nebraska, when I arrived, knew anything about echocardiography. It was the very first stage of experience in echo. And I spent some time in Indianapolis with Harvey Feigenbaum, the father of American echo. And so I became kind of the echo guru of, of Nebraska. And the University of Nebraska really wanted me because of that. They had no cardiologists knew anything about echo. So. He enticed me to be both the program director for the fellowship and to run uh, non-invasive cardiology, which was good. I enjoyed that. And we love living in, uh, in, in Omaha. And Omaha was a nice, I could have lived in Omaha forever, which it was a nice town. But that atmosphere with this, uh, with this chief and I just clashed. And so my old buddies in Lincoln said, come back and come back to us. So I did for 10 years. And that was, was Joe Ship the chair of medicine at Nebraska yeah. when you were there? Yeah. It seems like that's the sort of problem that Ship should have dealt with as opposed to letting it get out of control like that. Yeah, Joe was, Joe was an interesting guy. As you know, he was an endocrinologist, diabetologist. Uh, and we became pretty good friends. Uh, he had a clash uh, with the dean and, uh, and left after within about the time I left, actually, I think. Uh, and I think he went to California at some private hospital with a training program in some some hospital in California. But I, uh, the problem with private practice cardiology in the late 80s was intervention hit, and I was not trained in that. And we added two young cardiologists that were now properly trained. But when you're on call, it was expected that everybody do what everybody else does, including intervention. And the, you know, the way medicine was taught is so sad. It really was the old watch one, do one, teach one era. And I was just really unhappy with being forced to do my job on a cute MI. Well, take him to the lab and put a balloon in there and open it up, not being formally trained, literally just somebody just kind of holding my hand for a couple of cases and th this is how we do it. I was did not like that. That's not the way medicine should be practiced. Well, we added a couple of young guys to, to, to do that, but they didn't want to be always on call. So if I was on call and I needed an intervention, do I call them? Nope, you do it yourself. And the pressure to, to do that finally got to me. And I, when the job as chief cardiology at Truman and UMKC opened, uh, 
I, I bet it's a good decision. Good decision. Yeah. So that's how I left private practice for good and went in back. And that's 1990 that I went, went to the University of uh, UMKC as the, as the chief. Yeah. How did you spend the remainder of your career? Here in, at UMKC, I was uh, the chief there for 10 years. Uh, you know, you've worked in a city hospital and you know how things uh, can turn to be tough economically. Uh, you don't have enough. We, we had a cath lab, but it was uh, combined with the radiology department and the and the plural equipment was inadequate. It was really built for the image intensifier was too big. And it was really for peripheral vascular work, not for a smaller six inch intensifier for coronary coronary visualization. So, and every time we had a, a patient needed help, we'd have to send it to uh, to another hospital. Initially, it wasn't St. Luke's; it was a research hospital. Uh, and I didn't like that, but eventually we got a relationship with St. Luke's that was so good that eventually uh, in 2000, uh, I was recruited to St. Luke's uh, to continue running the cardiology fellowship, but to be, uh, hip <laughs> there's my black cat, but to run a, uh, a service that was like it was at the, in many medical centers, the the, the non-insured service that the patients are admitted through the ER that didn't have insurance admitted to the teaching service, who will. And I ran that service uh, at uh, St. Luke's and continued to be the program director for the fellowship. And then a couple of years later, uh, the... Uh, the guy that was running a lipid and diabetic research uh, center got recruited, did so well, he got recruited by Mayo and went to Mayo. And when he left, uh, the head of the, the associate dean of medical therapy, because now St. Luke's was in, had been combined and intimately related to UMKC, said, uh, Forker, how do diabetics die? He said, well, heart attack and stroke. You're going to run the diabetic research center. <laughs> <laughs> Which was, a, you know, it was good at that point in time. I'm now approaching, approaching my, I think I was past somewhere between 65 and 70 and thinking about retiring. And that turned out to be kind of fun. That was kind of the stimulus that kept me going for another so I retired when I was 77, Dan. Uh, I might have been one of the oldest governors for ACP. I think I didn't become the governor until I was close to, close to 70. But anyway, the, uh, the spending the last seven, eight years running a diabetic, you know, by then the statins and lipid programs had pretty much run out. Now there's a whole new era of newer drugs for uh, for lipids. But then it, we primarily switched over to, which was the correct thing to do, all the new diabetic drugs that uh, we were heavily involved with multi-center trials. Uh, and it helped have a few publications from that experience. So, uh, so I was a diabetologist like Joe Shipp for the last uh, seven or eight years of my career. And I, and I enjoyed it. I really did. Hmm. How'd you get involved with the college? Well, when I returned to uh, Kansas City in 1990 in Truman and UMKC, uh, I don't, it's an interesting question because I had, I, in Nebraska, I had done quite a lot of work with the continuing education and uh, with the Nebraska chapter, but uh, wasn't on the board or anything. And arrived in uh, and back in Kansas City, and I had a hunch that there was something might be fun with ACP. So the first year that it was in back in the Ozarks, uh, I signed up and went. And Rich Whiting, 
I had known Bretch Whiting uh, years before when he was still on the University of Missouri uh, Columbia uh, faculty. And there was Rich Whiting and we hooked up and it turns out he was chair of the education committee. And I said, well, if I wanted to be involved, what do you think I ought to do? He says, you ought to be on the education committee with me. And that's how it started. Sarah Walker, Sarah Walker was the, was the governor then and got introduced to Sarah and says, I'm a cardiologist. I work at MKC. And within the next couple of months, Sarah put together a program that included a cardiologist and she invited me to be the cardiology speaker. And both from Dick Whiting and Sarah, that kind of lit the fire to, to be involved. And you know the rest of the story, but uh, I've enjoyed Missouri. And for me, uh, being a native Kansan, first working at UMKC and now working with Missouri uh, chapter ACP, it was a huge stimulus and opened my horizons more than I ever thought possible because I would tell you going back to undergrad, I played freshman football at KU. I was very fast, you know, with my size, 5'11 and 170 pounds, but uh, I was fast and played on the freshman football team. And we played Missouri when that year in Lawrence and I scored the first touchdown against Missouri. <laughs> it's a good memory. Sadly, Missouri came back and scored more touchdowns than one. <laughs> <laughs> but my, my perspective of Missouri was they're the enemy. That's who we, that's who we play in, in college sport. They're the enemy. So it was interesting for me how I really became very comfortable being a, being a Missouri faculty and Missouri ACP. I thought it was uh, really a highlight of my life. The people I met, the, the friends I've made for life uh, has really been fun. Yeah, a real joy. So what do, you, what do you, in looking back over your career, what do you think, um... What, what really gives you joy as you look back over it? See that black cat? I see that black cat, yeah. <laughs> here, he, here she comes again. Okay, go back over there. I think if he's like our dog, he he likes to get in front of, between whatever we're doing and him, you know? That's right. Well, when I'm sitting here at my desk, uh, she always is right here with me. Okay, now you can just stay right there. She's always, she's wherever I am, she is. So that's that's what it's all about. So I asked that question again, Dan. Yeah. Oh, looking back on your career, what do you what do you think gives you joy looking back on it? Oh, right. Well, I'd have to say, uh, I'd have to say that being a teacher is my highest uh, is my my highest joy. Um, I was fortunate that at UMKC at Nebraska it was a different situation. But at here at UMKC, uh, it was ideal situation uh, far as uh, I was a docent for six years and had 12 medical students under my wing and did two months every year on an internal medicine inpatient rotation. And until we lost all of our cardiologists, I had no longer had time to do that. So couldn't do it any longer. But uh, the mentoring and the in the family atmosphere, lots of time spent with uh, both socially and on the job uh, was one of my highlights of, uh, of UMKC. Did, did any of your kids become a doctor? You know, back in those, back at that earlier fork in the road about being a history professor or going to medical school, you know that 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 has still that still bothered me even to this day. Saying, I bet you I'd been a heck of a history professor, <laughs> and not had to go through what I did uh, in human anatomy, dissecting a cadaver, or internship, having every other night call and almost killing you. Uh, it might have been more pleasant to be a history professor. <laughs> But uh, that's water over the dam. Yeah. 
No, I'm glad I chose medicine. Medicine has been very rewarding and uh, relationships, uh, the things I've learned, the things I've evolved and later taught. Uh, you know, I think it's been very rewarding. Uh, did, did any of your kids become a doctor? <laughs> no. My, uh, I have a son and two daughters, and none of them were interested in science. They're all social scientists. My son has a master's in English. My older daughter went to divinity school, has a master's in divinity. And the younger daughter, uh, uh, I'd have to say she wanted to be a, a teacher, an elementary school teacher, but she never could pass the, the math tests. <laughs> so she's a full-time mom with, with, four t with four kids. But uh, no. They were all social scientists, none of them. I could never figure that out. You guys don't like chemistry, don't like physiology, don't like biology. None of them liked any of the biological science. And my wife was that, my wife was that way too. Yeah. Never took a course in, uh, in any type of science class, never did. She if was a, kids ask, do you, tell, do you tell them they should think about going to medical school? Yeah. I'll say that again. I'm, I'm I said, if, if, if uh, young people ask, uh, do, you, do you advise going to medical school? And if they ask you while they're in medical school, do you advise going into internal medicine? Yes, I do. Yeah, yeah. I do. No, no question. And that, that influence back of being a docent and having those 12 students and constantly by the time they're junior and as you know, it's a source six year curriculum, but by the time they're year five and six, they're just like medical students every place else. So uh, third and fourth year student elsewhere is the same as a year five and six at uh, UMKC. And so they're thinking about where they want to go and what they want to do. So it's been a lot of time. And it, and also a different perspective is that uh, now we had tons of female medical students and I had quite a number that you've had the same experience of saying, how am I going to balance? What if I want to get married? What if I want to have children? How can I be a wife, a mother, and a doctor? Well, in cardiology now, I tell you, it, uh, it's been helped by the development of all the non-invasive field. And there are many practices that you can be a cardiologist and just do an office non-invasive practice not have all the night call in the hospital and have plenty of time uh, plenty of weekends off to be a to be a mother and and wife so that that that, that is yeah i think i think it i think it also helps and i and I, I don't a lot of women you know maybe get their blinders on about who is an appropriate person to marry you know uh, if you're a professional you expect that you're going to marry another professional but two of the happiest women doctors i know are both married to carpenters yeah one of them one of them was my intern when i was a resident she married a norwegian carpenter and they're still going strong 40 some years later yeah. and i think he's just a solid guy that helped out a lot around the house and with the kids and and so on and so on so yeah it's, you know i think that I think that development of emergency medicine is a separate uh, specialty and of hospitalists. Right. I think both of those have helped the ladies, help the female doctors because they have plenty of rotation off. Uh, yeah. so, well, sort, of, sort of last question. I don't know if you saw the State of the Union the other night, but if you were Biden's healthcare advisor, what would you tell him to do? Be a I'm sorry, but be I said little... if you were Biden's healthcare advisor. Oh, oh yeah, I, I, I thought you said Biden. <laughs> yeah, what would you tell him after, to do? After the State of the Union ad address, it's interesting to see the comments. And but uh, you know, I remember uh, back to history of medicine uh, when Franklin Franklin Roosevelt, FDR. And he died of an intracerebral hemorrhage. Uh, I always remember. Uh, so I read this history someplace. Oh, well, a cardiologist here in Kansas City wrote a little book on the, on the health of presidents. 
And I got a copy of that. But I didn't know that FDR had blood pressures of 150 over 130 the last couple of years of his life. And, of course, died of an intracerebral hemorrhage. Right. And you know what his doctor was then? His doctor was an ENT doctor. Uh Now, I don't. I think their ENT doctors are good doctors in their field, but I don't think an ENT doctor ought to be in charge of the president's health. So I would advise, first of all, you got to have competent physicians looking after the, our, our president and the, and the key members of his cabinet, uh, whether that's Walter Reed or Bethesda, whatever, you ought to have access to some real. And I think they do once they, uh, you know, Ike, how many heart attacks did Ike have? Three right. or four? <laughs> and ended up, I think, at Walter Reed, not not Bethesda, but I don't totally remember that. Uh, no, he was at Walter Reed. One of my one of my friends was basically an intern who was glued to his bedside during his final months. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So, uh, yeah, I think uh, like like everybody else in life, they need uh, they need quality medical care, and uh, I think. Presidents should be the first in line, frankly. Yeah. And of course, All right, my- I'm going to bring it to a close. Uh, thank you very much for taking the time to do this. I appreciate it. Yeah, well, it's been enjoyable. It's good to see you and talk to you. Right.